up until this year is just petrol cars but now it's, it's fully electric you don't get the noise you don't get that but there are a thousand horsepower evs that will do 0 to 60 in 1.3 seconds even any business i do now it's firstly the brand name and the branding and the trademark then i go to all the next steps i want a global brand i want to see this globally i want to be able to walk so you want to see this in australia you want to see it yeah. in america you want i want to, see to fly around racing and pop into a garage and pick a can up for us we're looking in that storage of energy space i think for us is yeah. where we're looking to go so the batteries type stuff yeah battery type stuff some this mainly the reason we're involved with ev racing apart from i like to race and it's at the highest end and, and racing is great um it'd be nice to make some money from racing and part of that is looking in this ev space whether it's storage of electricity for charging and different things like this that's where i see that industry going being involved in racing in the energy drink business everything's fast moving one minute it's a high next minute it's a low much more up and down um, the property side for me it's more slow there's six months of planning you're waiting for answers development takes a long time it's a slower churn Clarity, direction, and success way beyond what we ever previously thought possible. Here's your host, Frankie Lee. First things first, guys, before we get started with this podcast, do me a solid favor and subscribe to this on whatever platform you're listening to it right now. Whether that's YouTube, Spotify, Apple Podcasts, I'd appreciate if you just hit that subscribe button and it lets me know that the content that I'm putting out for you guys is hitting your ears at the right time. Much love. This podcast is sponsored by contentremover.com. So whether you're looking to remove any images, videos, search results, fake Instagram accounts, get in touch with us at contentremover.com. Welcome back to the Frankie Lee podcast. And today, guys, I'm hyped to bring you my very first UK episode with the man himself. And I'm telling you now, whatever introduction I give this man, it's going to be too short because, and you're going to find out why on this podcast, but Mr. Oliver Bennett here, race car driver, owner of Excite Energy, which has just gone into like every major service station in the UK. And mate, welcome to the podcast. Thank you for having me, mate. First one in the UK as well. So it's nice to be uh first one back for you mate, on, uh, on my home turf at least anyway, but I've been driving this two and a half hour journey to get here. And I've been so excited about doing this podcast because <laughs> it's like, you know, honestly, it means a lot to me doing doing this with you. But obviously, just being in the UK and the summer's coming and sun is shining, big podcast booked and everything. But before before we go into obviously everything you're doing with Excite, obviously race car driver, give me a bit of an insight. Give us so the people I'm kind of understand how you've come up and everything like that. Give give them a bit of an insight into how you've how you built. Was cars and racing always some part of your childhood, or how did you get into that? Yeah, always. Um, I raced when I was small, probably from the age of like five, I guess, but on bikes. So like most people where I live, we uh, grew up in the countryside, in the Forest of Dean. It's a beautiful place in the UK. Beautiful, um, beautiful. It's one of the biggest natural forests, I think, in the UK. Um, so yeah, I grew up in a very rural area. A lot of people, you know, push bikes, motorbikes, that was just what you'd done when you were a kid. Um, so I just grew from there. We, you know, we would race on bikes. It got serious on in the motocross scene. Um, raced all across the UK into Europe in some places really enjoyed it and just that gave me the bug for racing um, you know when we were little me and some friends we'd buy like 100 pound scrap cars that would run we'd yeah. go into the fields and we'd just race them all weekend until they wouldn't work and we'd go cash it back in for 100 pounds and then pick the next one up and just go again and that's actually probably where I learned to race cars and find grip and go fast and overtake cars without crashing into them that's probably where i learned everything on, the, on, on those country back roads on those, well just country fields yeah, yeah we just say to a farmer Mate, can we race ranger field we set some cones up um get some scrap cars and just drive around until they didn't work and then scrap them in and get another one so yeah, it's a great way to spend your youth actually looking back really cool really good fun yeah because I, I i even even when i was growing up you know we were, we were buying cars for like 200 pound racing them down the back roads with no tax on them and then and then like you know dropping them on the side <laughs> of the road <laughs> yeah and letting them get picked up somewhat some some travelers will come pick them up for scrap yeah and takes you back to your child and and it's like so it's it's so like that here you you kind of when, when, when i've been in australia you kind of forget that that england is like that do you know yeah. what i'm saying yeah there's very rural parts of the, of the uk and you have small communities there everyone's into motorsport is quite a big thing in these rural communities especially i see it when i race in the states the rural communities are so behind motorsport so that's how i grew up racing really obviously way different to what i do now um in different level and everything that was just some fun back then but i think that's probably what 
the precursor of why I can race now at the level I do. So yeah, yeah. All stems so what age were you when you first went professional? Um, probably four years ago, I would say, was my first sort of pro race, which is, uh, that was in the FIA World Rallycross. Yeah. Um, I actually had not a very long history in racing cars, so I raced motocross until I was 18. Um, yeah. Stopped after university for a couple of years, just growing up, what do you want to do in life? Racing Bikes at the time was super dangerous. A lot of my friends, I had a few friends that broke their backs and legs and, you know, really struggled from that then to move on. You've only got to be um, out by a f- few millimetres. Yeah, do you know what I mean? And then you, you're growing up a bit. I think you start to think, why am I doing this so so high risk? The reward is fairly minimal, I guess, apart from trophies and things. Um, so I packed it in and then didn't, I just worked then basically in various businesses, which we'll, we'll probably come on to, um, but just worked for a few, three or four years. But it's felt a little... You know, a little bit lost in that ambition of his. I enjoyed the work and I enjoyed business, but it wasn't what I was passionate about. Um, I, what I was passionate about was racing, and 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 how I got back into it. Then I actually um, saved up a small bit of money, not much at all. I think at the time it was probably only like fifteen thousand pounds. Probably I was twenty. 22, 23 at the time, I went and bought an old Group B rally car. Yeah. Just thought, I'm going to buy it. I found a guy local who was selling it. It was in good nick to do some rallies in, which was stage rally. So for those that don't know, that's, you know, like you see four, five, ten Ks through the forest and with a navigator telling you where to go and you go all day. So I started in that. Like Colin McRae type thing. Exactly that. Yeah. yeah. Colin McRae rally type stuff. Um, so I bought a car to do that, and then I fell in love with racing again. Um, done my first race. Actually, in the Forest of Dean was my first uh, rally i done. It's a little national rally here. And I came ninth out of 80 cars in that. Uh, I think I was top three in my class. And I just got the bug, and I was like, well, four wheels is safer, because um, if you crash, you've got protection and everything. And uh, I just fell in love with four-wheel racing again. And I'd done rallying for probably a year, not that long. Um, it wasn't quite for me. You, you know, motocross all my life, you race 20 bikes off a start, um, you're all together, you're all competing together. I um, mean, it, it's a race, basically, isn't it? Race to the finish. Rally is different. You're doing a whole day of driving by yourself against the clock with 80 other people against the clock, but you can't see them. So are you going fast? Are you going slow? Oh, yes. Yeah, so you've got no, you got no, no reference, reference point. really, yeah, yeah. Of, of how you're doing. So I didn't really take to that in terms of it wasn't competing like I was used to. And I fell, uh, fell across rally cross actually, which is what I do now, um, which is going electric this year, which is... Very similar to motocross. There's six cars. You're on a start grid. There's a first corner. The light goes green. And whoever gets over the line in first is first. And I yeah. was like, well, this is basically motocross on steroids in cars. Um, so I, that's where I went. And racing. you said it's all going electric? Yeah, this year it's all electric. So just in the building over there, we've got two FC1 Nitro Rallycross cars. So again, for those that don't know on your channel, Rallycross was born from Group B era rally cars. So rally cars that were too dangerous to rally basically ended up doing rallycross on these little circuits. Um, so crazy cars, 600 horsepower, flames, anti-lag, all the all the, all the the works, um, which I raced up until this year is just petrol cars. But now it's, it's fully electric, which sounds crazy. But, you know, okay, you don't get the noise, you don't get that, but there are 1,000 horsepower EVs that will do 0 to 60 in 1.3 seconds. 1,000 horsepower in an yeah. electric vehicle. Yeah, it's absolutely mental. That's absolutely insane because it's instant power, isn't it? When you it's put it down, yeah, instant talking, instant power. Um, and they're serious bits of kits. They've got gears, flappy paddles, and things. Is is they're not messing around. So. Are more and more petrol heads in your industry getting onto these electric cars and starting to buy into them now? At the top end, especially because I think the whole whole consumer market is going EV. Yeah. Um, you know whether you like petrol cars or not. I'm sure. I mean, I've got a Porsche. They're a petrol one. I'm sure there'll be weekend cars like that where you can drive them on the weekend, probably with an e-fuel or something that's better for the environment. And I think your daily car will be uh, an electric car and probably one day autonomous and you'll just get in it and it'll drive you around. So yeah, that's, that's the way that, it's going. That's literally, that's, that's literally where everything's going, yeah. I think. Like, and I think that's where as racing drivers, we play at the t- elite end where we're at now. Um, we're at the forefront of that technology. So that it's all EV if you want to race at that level. I love it. And you've you've gone, obviously... You, you were talking about what you'd done in, in, in terms of funding that. You, you, I believe you worked at like CEO level of a com- company mm-hmm. and brand. And what, what else were you doing along that journey to get to the, you know, get money in the bank to be able to fund yeah. all, fund everything you've been doing? Yeah, yeah. So we're on a, a property site here, which is um, part of a, a family group of businesses, I guess, that my, my father started. He was a mechanic by trade, probably why I, I like motorsport and cars and things. He then went on to um, a plastics recycling business. Um, in selling that, he then moved into to property. So 
as I was leaving university, it was just about the time of the renewable era, I guess. Um, and I sat down with him. We, we had some discussion. I said, look, the renewables are coming. It's coming fast. Um, it, it's something we could see ourselves getting involved in is, is a family business. Um, and I was the MD and in, in sort of directed that project, I guess, which was installing ground mount solar uh, and wind turbines across the UK. So I spent probably three or four years doing that. We had a really successful run it actually. I think we was up a team to thir- a team of 30 at one point, yeah. um, which was, you know, we would find sites, we would get the grid applications, we would install, um, we would maintain, and, and we would obviously profit from the electricity going into the grid. Um, and we'd done that until the government cancelled the tariff, which was a tariff the the government paid a fee for this clean energy, which really is what supported the cost of it. Of course, costs have dropped now. You can do it now. You're seeing a resurgence now in the economy, uh, in re- in the renewable in- industry, where you can do it again now because the cost of panels and everything is, is kind yeah, of Yeah, dropping low. down, yeah. Um, but at the time I was doing it, it just wasn't feasible without the tariff. So the business, I guess, stopped in terms of um, there was no new business coming. We still have the assets now. The, the assets are still running. As long as the sun comes up, they'll still make some money. Yeah. Um, so that's still going. But that's probably where then I went heavier into the racing, um, pushed harder on racing, and ultimately ended up here with this drink. So, so it, it, from, from, from a commercial standpoint, is the, racing, is, is, is the racing something that gets the energy drink out there in, in terms of marketing terms? Or is the racing a profitable asset profitable thing in itself racing um to make money at racing is very difficult most people don't most people cover costs if they can with sponsorship um unless you're in the formula one level of things where there's probably money to be made with that sort of level of brand engagement i think for the racing on the most part is about covering costs which is where brands sponsor teams yeah uh, for obviously the the audience and the awareness um, and then the teams use that money to cover the cost to go racing in essence um so that's really how the racing uh, it sort of ran, I guess, from a, a commercial point of view. The drinks sort of came into that for two reasons. I was going racing anyway at an elite level yeah, where there was uh, an opportunity for brand exposure. Um, sort of looking at it from an entrepreneurial point of view, not only was I drinking a lot of energy drinks, I'd done a sports nutrition degree when I was younger. I was into health and fitness, going to the gym, training, wouldn't really pick up a old energy drink let's call it with some you know ingredients you can't read and, and things you yeah, can't pronounce yeah, yeah. And is it good for you is it bad for you what benefit are you getting and just thought you know there's definitely a product need here for something healthier that's got new topics for focus can help with brain function um, and give you the benefits you want really in this day and age for an energy drink um, so i could see a gap in the market i was going racing and i needed a brand to promote and and really it sort of it really just aligned of thinking well If I can promote my own brand, find a gap in the market to get distribution to make some money, and that can come back around and pay for me to go racing, I'll live happily ever after racing cars and selling uh, a a brand that I'm proud of uh, with a product that I think is good. So that's sort of how it all started at that level probably four years ago, four or five years ago. And you you started it from, I believe you started it from from literally... um a shipping container, wasn't it? You started it from a shipping container. In terms of, in terms yeah, of like the drink, li- li- yeah, li- that's li- where our office yeah. was. Yeah, we were in a, a shipping container, sort of office down in Bristol. So they, it was it was four startups called Box Park in down in Bristol. But yeah, they were. I think there was nine or ten containers, um, cheap rent, everything included, um, services and everything. And that was where Excite was born, which was me, and my partner Megan's involved in the business. Um, she runs the marketing and MPD side on the drinks. And um, we had a couple of, of employees in that in that container office for sales and marketing and things. And yeah, it just grew from there. And obviously then we moved into bigger offices in Bristol. Um, before the pandemic, we had a big office, a team of probably 20 in, in Bristol. And, and that slowly sort of changed in the COVID pandemic, obviously working from home and different things. Now we have satellite offices, one in Bristol, one here and one in London. Yeah. Um, and people come in different days and things when they want. So, yeah. Yeah, I like, I like the way you structured that. But I want to go through some of the trials and tribulations that you've had. Because, look, formulate, f- let's, let's, let's be honest. When you, when you create an energy drink in the way that you have, you, not only do you have to formulate something completely different to differentiate yourself from the market, but you're going into a really crowded space with the monsters, the Red Bulls that are at the top of the game here. How did you go about, you know, getting it right in terms of like the branding and, and everything like 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 the, the the way it looks now in the yeah, can? Yeah. It it didn't start like that, did it? No, no, no. So so how how long did it take to refine something like this and get an energy product to market 
that, uh, that, that you that you were actually happy with that could actually go and take on these big boys? A long time. I think, I mean, it's something you, I think you learn in business where you think you're happy every time and then you sit for a week and you realise you could probably do better. I think that's just business innate. I think we're always developing. Um, but yeah, we got some wrong, we got some right. In total, it's been four years of development. I think we've probably had a product brand and everything knitted together to from a, you know, distribution and consumer point of view it's probably been the last eight months has been right whereas i'm like this is this is probably it now i could see a global business here with this branding and with these drinks um but there was how many cans i've got a wall actually in one of our offices there's like a, a history of the cans you've got all the different cans lineage yeah, yeah, yeah. All, all the different flavors the different designs and everything but i think i would say this is probably the fifth product rendition um we were quite lucky on the formulation so the first drink we done didn't quite hit the mark. Um, it was a similar beverage to this, but we had green tea in it. But unbeknown to us, the green tea settled in the bottom of the cans after like 10, 12 weeks, and it was went a bit weird. Um, so scrap that idea. Yep. Took the green tea out. Then actually, this was our second formulation that has worked, and it stayed through eight. So every rendition of can design and brand design has always had this liquid in, just the can has changed around it. So this is probably our fifth brand evolution now. Um, in the space of four years and did, did when you when you first started excite did you have any problems in terms of getting the brand name trademarking and yeah. all this kind of stuff was what walk me through that process of, of how of, of, of all yeah. that. just just so the listeners get a true understanding of how you've how you've gone about taking this brand from 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 like a concept to putting it on a can because like anybody can pull a name out but like a lot of these kind of short, sharp names like Excite are taken by these bigger brands like Coca-Cola. Yeah. They've already registered them and they shelve them. Yeah. So it's yeah, like, yeah, yeah. was there any problems with, with all that kind of stuff? No problems, just time. Like probably, I think it, I would say the first year or two out of the four years up until now was brand designs, logo choice. We had different names. I've got different can mock-ups with different names. Um, we probably had four or five names, um, different ones. Some had trademark issues, some didn't, some just didn't quite sit. This one actually was the last name we came up with, we were all sat there, um, it was probably a year in, it was with our um, head of uh, uh, head of fitness gym accounts at the time, Jamie um, and Megan, we were all sat in the room, and we're like, right, what name can we get global, how can we get this name we want, like, we want the drink to be exciting, we want people to feel like energy from it, and he was like, what about Excite? And we just all looked at each other, and I was like, well, that definitely could work, but obviously, it's too. Lo- I wanted something short. I wanted like four letters. Yeah. Um. Just something short, impactful. You, you know, when we blow the logo up, it can get massive quite quickly. So it just stands out everywhere. Yeah. Um. And I was like, I love. We we all just instantly looked at each other. You know, when you get that feeling, you're like, that that's that could work. And then I was like, well, there's no chance we're going to get trademarks for that. Um. And started looking into it, and because of the unique spelling and the formatting and the stuff, it just worked. Um. And, and you got you got global from day one. Yeah, global from day one. I mean, we. Looking back, a bit of a mistake. We didn't go global day one. We'd done the UK and things, but now we have it globally. We just didn't register it all at once, which we probably should have. Um, so give it, what problems can you come up against as a brand if you don't go global from day one? Like, Because it, is it a case of like, if you, if you, if you, if you trademark it in the UK, and you tra- say you trademarked it in Australia, yeah, yeah. and then you wanted the US trademark, do you get preference on the US trademark because of the pre-registries in the, in the UK no, and Australia? No. No. no, no, no. You do in Europe, um, but now the UK is not in Europe, so I'm not sure how that would work. But typically, when you register in the UK, there would be some delay on registering in Europe. I think it was six months or something, not long. Um, but no, the US would be standalone. Yeah. Asia would be standalone. Um, all of these other sort of typical uh, places would be standalone places you'd have to register. So, yeah, I've I've actually heard of one of the biggest brands in this sector um, did fail to, in the early days, re- register their trademark in a certain location. They paid a lot of money to get it. Yeah. But there was just some guy um, in the other location, I won't say names and things, but he saw it and he was like, well, I'll register that if they're not going to. And they had to pay him a lot of money for it. So, so Burger King in Australia is called Hungry Jacks because of that exact problem. No, really? Yeah. really? So but, but <laughs> Burger King cannot operate in Australia as Burger King yeah, yeah, has yeah. to operate as Hungry Jacks yeah. so that, that that's that's, that, that's that. the whole concept yeah. of, of like why you should always trademark that's why I wanted to go over it on here because not a lot of people realise no. realise this that no, important. You, you know that you, you gotta you gotta own your brand name and, and gotta protect it otherwise you, you know you, you can work and you can formulate everything and then all of a sudden you got a can and you can't and you, you, you 
say you branded a hundred because I think the minimum order of energy drink cans is must be about a hundred thousand pieces, right? More now, thanks to steel. Probably, I think it's three hundred thousand now. Three hundred. So you got to get yeah. so so to launch an energy drink, guys, you got to put three hundred thousand cans for a, for a branding machine. If you have got your brand on it, but you haven't trademarked it, and then you and then you you going into you got you got a lot of cans <laughs> to drink. You, you, you got Personally. you got a lot of problems, and the, yeah. the, I I I know brands that have kind of had been smacked right in the yeah. teeth with these kind of issues. Like, oh, and there's something you learn, I think, early on that first. Even any business I do now, it's firstly the brand name and the branding and the trademark. Then I go to all the next steps. But that's how, the first one. How important has it when you go into when you go into a new market, which is obviously energy drinks was to was to like mm. the family business type yeah, thing. Yeah. I mean, you were in commercial property, you built like a massive. We'll talk about that later. But you built a massive commercial real estate portfolio and all that kind of stuff as well. And then you got the race team. But how how important was it to get the right people on the bus in terms of like an energy drink and taking it to market? Was did you have to go and get special special type of marketing people that have marketed for energy drinks before? Or, or? No, I mean, looking back, maybe I would do it different. But we done it very budget shoestring ad hoc. Um, no agencies. We done everything in house. Um, I hired a freelance designer who we went through the design with us. Yeah, almost like because I can operate the software. I'd be like, we'll move this this way. Do that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. And we done it very much like that. Look and feel. Um, which is probably why it took four times. I mean, if you probably went to a branding agency and say, just do it, they might have done it right the first time, but it would have cost, um, you know, you're probably 50, 100 grand with a design brand agency to do that. Yeah. We didn't have the money at the time in the brand. Um, you know, it didn't really want to put that spend into it. It was much more of a passion project originally. Um, uh, it's something I could see a gap for the market. So we done it very organically like that um, and, and pushed that way, really. Yeah. And do, do you think, do you think it is something that you will, You've you, you obviously you, as businesses and businesses that you kind of build are built to be saleable assets down in the future. Is it something you think that you will sell off in the future in terms of like as as an exit thing? Have you planned planned it from from day one to exit the brand in the future? Or I think it depends. We I've never ruled one way or the other with that. We get asked that a lot. You know, are you are you going to try sell it to Coke? What's the plan? Is it that sort of business? But I think it's it would be see to see how the business evolves itself I think I would like to keep control of it forever I think that would be number one priority whatever control means at that stage is it control of the brand in different things one thing in this industry is distribution is super difficult you've got to distribute you know those cans say now we're in uh, in 900 garages across the UK you've got to get that into 900 garages um, every day replenished and it's not easy to distribute on that scale um, we need to make sure we have stock in warehouse every time um, it's got to leave our warehouse, get to another warehouse. There's sort of three touch points, I guess, before it gets to the store level. So that's a big management process. If I could prove that the brand is viable, consumers like to drink it, people enjoy the brand, and say, you know, hey, to one of the big guys, could you just put it in all the shops? That would be, you know, a dream. But walk, walk me, walk me through the the fulfillment process in order to make. Obviously, you saw Was it with Budgeons you signed a contract with? No. So MFG is called Motor Fuel Group. So they own and operate nine well yeah, nine hundred garages. So we got a full listing in the UK. So that could be Budgeon, Shell, Londis, um, it could be any garage you go into really. Um, and they would operate the the systems for those garages. So what stock they have, what their yep. planograms are, which is what goes on shelf, the fuel they buy, every they would manage the garage. But it could be uh, owner operator garage, um, or it could be a budgeons group, a Londis. So yeah, that's how it works. So in, in regards to getting a listing mm. in that in that Garrett in though in that group how long does it take in order to put to, to to put and get signed off a listing in a group like that years yeah years i would say um so one thing you'll have range reviews which um would be done once a year so if you miss one of those you've got to wait till the next year which right. for a business like this is difficult because um if you miss some range reviews and you've got to wait 12 months where does cash flow come from for 12 months what do you do with the employees and everything? Um, which is a problem, especially in the UK, smaller market, less doors. Um, if you miss range reviews with, say, the uh, the big supermarkets and big garage groups, and you've got to wait another year, well, the question is, where do you sell cans for a year to, to yeah. go again in the next time? So that can be problematic for new brands. Um, and then, of course, you've got to get the buyer on board. So um, you might get into the range review and they might say, well, maybe not this year, but maybe next year. And you know that can that process can take a long time. So they pick you for the range, and then you get in the garage, and then they do they they what they give you twelve months, and then and then they see what you've sold, and then and then they and then evaluate, they, yeah. they reassess and yeah. reevaluate. Not even twelve months; you probably get six month window um, to make it work once your brand is in store. 
Um, we'll get monthly data sales out and you'll just be compared to everything they've got on shelf. So you're compared to, uh, you know, Red Bull, um, you're compared to new other new brands like you and then they'll sit down um, and, you know, it's very simple for them. They're a business. They've got a two meter fridge, let's say, yep. full of products and all they're looking at is a and l and they're like, right, from this two meter fridge, I want to make, let's keep it easy, 200 grand a month. Um, all right, well, these brands are delivering 180K. These brands are delivering 20K. I'll just put more of those brands in, which is why you end up with that typical scenario. And I used to think when I walk in, well, why is there like 400 rows of the same thing? Well, it's just because they sell the most and people keep picking it up. So they just give that more space, which makes it even more difficult for new brands like us, because we've then got to say that thing is selling really well. Can you give me a bit of that space? Yeah. And they're like, well, it's selling really well. Why would we give you space? And you've got to obviously put the argument forward is, is to why they should give you that space and why they should try it. Yeah, because obviously with, with with yours, your point of difference is like you you are you are going in as a healthy energy drink rather yeah. with 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 less of the toxins and all that kind of stuff in it. So you're trying to position yourself on the shelf as as a healthy option in that garage for for the consumer to pick up. But how do you make sure that you're from from a from a design point of view? How how have you made sure that people are drawn to that and pick it up off the shelf? Mm. Because that 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 to me is is. That there must be something within this design that is designed to make yeah. people to make people yeah, do yeah, that. Yeah. How did you how did you come to that conclusion? Because when you're going into 900 garages, you're not going to launch in in there with something that you guys don't think is your best opportunity of getting it off the shelf. Yeah, yeah, so, no, you're, you're completely true, and that's why pre-COVID, COVID was a bit of a breath um, a breath of fresh air for us as a brand because I think it gave us six months to step back and instead of chasing the market, chasing the sales, chasing the marketing, um, we sat there with an economy that was closed down. People weren't going out. People weren't buying drinks. We sat there and thought, right, now we've got six months to just sit here and basically do what you just said, make people pick this up no matter what. Um, And that's when we've come to this final brand rendition, which um, we did actually get some agency help for this final design. There was some consultancy uh, processes. There was large-scale... sort of questionnaire questionnaires yeah. done on different designs which we couldn't do previously as a small business um you know just it costs a lot of money to get the sample size so we went through that process until we got to this can which was what we thought portrayed a um you know a healthier focus enhancing energy product that has nootropics which is our our sort of key usb of being healthier with nootropics to help brain function and trying to display that on pack but even I learned a lot of sometimes less is more from words. You can get yeah, 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 when yeah, you're yeah, a new yeah. brand, you're like, well, let's just list everything that's great about the product, but people don't read it. So hence why we've got the X, the rainbow bursting flavors out from the rainbow, which is also like bursting of the mind um, for focus and things. And then of course, if that entices you and you come into the X, which draws your eye in, you start reading, you know, nootropic energy, three active nootropics. It's got the caffeine amount, five vitamins yeah, and, you know, supports mental performance. So you start to get drawn into what you want to see then. Is there is there is there any obviously I, I want to I really want to break down for 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 the guys listening like I presume there's th- this this color palette that you're using on all the cans is is a color is a color palette that not only goes bodes well together but it is is there some is it is it meant to because when I was researching a lot about color palettes in the past that they they different color palettes in create different emotions yeah. in the body yeah, yeah. Is, is is any of that thought about yeah when, well when i mean um you know part there's there's one thing standing out against the competitive set yeah um so there's two th- two reasons it's white um firstly white is associated with health and clinician and right. like sterile and clean and healthy yep. which is what the drink is um and then secondly white when you compare a lot of the traditional energy drinks they're dark masculine blacks blues right dark okay. color palette so again if we went for a dark gray can you just turn into a another another drink so yeah a lot of it is for sta- shelf stand out and then also what the colors mean when you see them yeah um, so, so this so this is more so this is not just to attract masculine it's to attract feminine as well like yeah. it, it don't obviously attract women to pick up the can and yeah. think of it's more healthy choice than grabbing a can of say monster yeah. or red yeah, and, Bull. and we we really position ourselves as a 50 50 brand split we're not um, you know, it's not a masculine brand. It's it's not necessarily a, a female brand either. It's very, you know, middle of the line. Um, it can appeal to a lot of people, which is key for us to make this a commercial success. It's got to appeal to a bigger audience, the better. Um, and a lot of the times, in, especially in the energy category, I think um, the female uh, consumer is, has been deserved a little bit in the branding architects of some of these brands. They're very masculine, very dominant Um uh, which I don't think is a bad thing, but I think, you know, there's there's things you can do to make it appeal to everyone. 
Yeah, I think I think I think these definitely when when you go past in the garage and you put this next to a can of the other drinks, I think this would definitely stand out more to more to the female eye just because of the, just because of the pinks and the, and the way that it sits off the white. Yeah, hundred percent. Because and obviously part of that inspiration, Megan, who's my girlfriend and also business partner, she's heavily involved in the business. Um, so we make joint decisions. I say, look, would you pick this up? She's like, well, not, not really. And we get to a point where I'm like, I would pick it up and she would pick it up. And then we're like, well, that's probably about right. Yeah. And then do you run it through, do you run it through like a, do you put it in a few locations and test the cans out in a few locations first in terms of like pick up and, and sales before you go run it out across 900 stores? We try to, but it's not easy. Um, you can't get small scale runs done of cans in, in general. So a lot of it is renders. Um, a lot of it, we use renders of cans and do surveys that way. Real life cans, unfortunately, you when you when you print them, you print a lot of them, yeah, um, and that's just the way it is. So, but that's a barrier to entry, um, a barrier to entry to the market, which serves, I guess, is a difficult thing for new brands. But of course, if you make it a success, it's much harder for people to enter. So it so, protects you. As so well. how does so the only reason then someone like Tyson Fury can launch an energy drink then is because obviously he's got he's got an energy drink company behind him that that white label his face onto the can then yeah yeah because so, yeah, he's because you've got to print you've got to basically print 300,000 cans as a minimum order. yeah 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 and I would assume he's not there running an energy drink business is yeah, yeah, busy course. doing his, his boxing and different things so yeah it, it'll be a company you know like we could if you wanted a, a can we face on it I could sort them out for you and you could you know we could sell them so, serious yeah do you know it's you know what, coming I, soon you have your I, face I, on the front I, of it I, I, I'm, think, I'm thinking about I'm thinking about uh, I mean, it's the, up to you if it sells but that's your yeah, problem yeah mate I reckon we can sell a few in Australia yeah, we'll sell a and, few. and the UK but no nah, I, I, re- I really love the way that you've gone about positioning that because I, and again it's like when you when you you must you must think to yourself when you order that first three hundred thousand cans you must shit yourself a little bit in terms of yeah. in terms of like you know are we how long does it take you to sell three hundred thousand cans I mean now not that long months um, maybe less probably we we would do probably order that many a month now um, on our sort of run rates originally we would order I think our first batch that probably lasted us. Over a year, probably eighteen months, that lasted us. Yeah, because um, yeah, we didn't have the sale rate to do it. But you can't order less. If we could have ordered ten thousand cans, we would have. But you can't. So there was that moment where you go, well, fuck it, we're just going to order them. And it's a great, it's a great way with a minimum order quantity of like three hundred thousand. Now it's a great way to defend the market. Yeah, if, if you if you actually think yeah. about it, because like obviously no, it 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 take it take a team of like a couple of years to get the to get their product ready and then put it into cans and it's the launch what. What do you reckon est- estimate it would cost now to launch an energy drink into a market like the UK? Depends how you want to do it. I think if you you can do it like we've done, um, I would say for probably a few million. I would say if you want to launch a brand with a retailer and do some marketing and stuff, a few. If I know big brands that enter new territories, say if they entered the U- UK market, they you know like Coke now do a lot of MPD with energy drinks. I think they, they would probably do. Drop thirty to fifty million day one on trying to make it work, wow. um, which would be advertisement, billboards, or everything like that. Um, and sometimes for them it doesn't even work. But of course, in their business model, um, you know, the fifty million quid is probably a chance for them, isn't it? And if yeah. it works, they've made a lot of money. If it doesn't, I'm sure the MPD team have got the next thing that they want to try. So, so what is your goal in terms of like where where do you hope to take this thing to? In terms of like how many cans per month are you going to scale this thing to? Cans per month? I don't, I don't know, but we, I want a global brand. I want to see this globally. I want to be able to walk. So you want to see this in Australia? You want to see it yeah. in America? You want I to want to fly around racing and pop into a garage and pick a can up. That's where I want to get this to. Um, and I think we're getting there. And the UK market's underway for us. We're we're making good head roads into the UK market. Uh, we launch in the US July August where. We're we're going to start off slowly there like the UK, build some distribution, build some branding. I'm racing there, so it's a, an excuse for me to do some marketing there as well. Um, obviously, we've got Jensen Budden who's joined the team. He's got yeah, some, a good I, US I love audience. That. So, love that. yeah, we're going to go over there and try and make it work there. There's a lot of volume to be done in the in the US. I mean, we talk about 900 garages here in the UK. There might be a garage group in, in the US with 9,000 garages which is more than there's probably just shops in the UK. So you can do a lot of volume in the US if you get it right. I think still for for probably all the energy drink brands, probably 50% of their turnover is the US. So you, when, when you when you launch into the US, obviously you get, you get manufacturing in the US yep. and you, you get third-party distribution all around the US, right? Yeah. Is is that something that takes that all that organization in there's a lot of organization in that, isn't yeah. there? Like what what kind of investment 
does, does it take to launch something in the US? Because that market is 300 million. Yeah, I mean, you could burn a lot of cash in the US, um, which I think is why we're going to start slow. We're, we obviously need a team in the US, which we're building now. Um, very much will be like the team we had at, at the start of the UK. So you'll have, uh, you know, you have a commercial MD, you'll have um, a, a couple of sales team, you'll have probably someone in charge of marketing in the, for the US market. And I think we're, we're going to pick a territory. So California. say pick California, easy examples, lots of healthy people there. Pick California and just focus on retailers and distribution in California. Get it working there. Learn probably some things you shouldn't do and some things you should, and then take on some different states and build it that way. I think you wouldn't be able to go into the US and just do the US. Yeah, is it? But you can license because obviously, like Coke and all that, all those kind of brands, they license production of their product yeah. in different territories. Is that yeah. something you'd, you wouldn't you would rather than launching in the US yourself? Wouldn't you license it to be produced by someone else who's already in that market? Um, that would be a distributor sort of thing, yeah. But that would be. Um, that would be a model that say uh, Pepsi would pick your brand up and they would they would take that market on for you. Um, but you need for for a, a distributor of a decent size to take you seriously. And, and basically, what are you doing for them? You're doing proof of concept and proof of market. They probably see probably want to see you twenty thirty million pound turnover. Right. And p- before they would say it's probably got a chance to to grow. Um, so you need to get to that stage really before they would they would put you in all the stores and do the distribution for you. And what kind of what kind of turnover is Excite doing in the UK at the moment? We're not far um, in the UK. I think the UK for us, if we could get between sort of five and eight million turnover in the UK would be good. Yeah. And um, we're halfway to that now already. So we're, we're having a good go. I think we'll be there in the next year or two. Yeah. Um, and that's why our eyes are obviously set on the, uh, on the US market. We've got some other overseas business in, uh, uh, quite a bit of growing business in Asia. We've got some in uh, in the Emirates, obviously Dubai, different things. Spent some time there. We've got some small business in Spain, France, Germany, these sort of areas. It for, for Excite, for Excite, yeah, yeah where yeah. we send it to um, distributors in in uh, different outlets in those countries, and they service that. Um, but but Asia is a very big growing market for us, especially for UK brands. They love UK branded products. They love UK made products, especially the liquid and things. So, so, you, so you don't have to, so when you launch into an Asian brand, my thinking would be you have to make the cat, make it look more Asian, but you're actually saying, you no, know, you leave it as a UK yep. brand. So it stands yep. out. Completely. Stands out, And they like UK products. So they trust, uh, you know, that we make good products with good ingredients and things and, and they trust it. So that works better. Yeah. Do you, do you manage even though even though a lot of the lot of the lot of the there's obviously some, there's some poor Asian countries, but are you talking about launching into China or, you, or which which part? Yeah, of Asia yeah, China, yeah, just China, China mostly. Yeah. yeah, they have big buying groups there that purchase boatloads of UK brands basically, and they'll uh, a bit like we get Chinese um, retail stores here with Chinese specific foods. I'm sure they have they I know they have quite a big British themed supermarket store there, not just for expats, but obviously for people that want to try British products and different things. So yeah, yeah it's a growing market there, which and, is really and cool. Obviously for you to for you to get to eight million in the US, you'd only have to enter California for that, wouldn't you? Yeah, yeah. I mean California, what is the economy? It's the fourth biggest in the it's world. It's the fourth it? fourth biggest in the world, yeah. yeah so yeah. you I mean, yeah, California alone would provide a great business for Excite if you could do well in California. Yeah, and, um, and, and if you prove it there you just you can just yeah, you, you map just, it out. Yeah, go to different states. Obviously different states with a, probably a younger health based demographic. So, um, you know, New York New Jersey, Texas is quite a good one for new energy brands now. So there's certain places you could pick that you would, you know, Florida, Miami, these areas, they're, they're where you would go. And I suppose, like you said, once you've proved the concept here and yeah. you've proved it in that in California, then obviously you, you'd distribute from there. Yeah, it's rinse yeah. and repeat model. Yeah. Like, uh, we've proved it in the UK. We've learned how to do this in the UK. We just pick it up and put it in California and go again, obviously nuances of, of the US market and consumer. Yeah. Um, but yeah, you can pick up and, and move around really, which is cool. That's epic. And talk to me about how signing Jensen Button as a driver, as uh, that that must have ex- massively expanded the reach of not only Excite the drink, but but the actual team itself as well. Yeah, no, it's done amazing for, for my brand and, and for the racing team. I mean, and for me as a racing driver, to be associated with Jensen, obviously former F1 world champion, uh, joining the team to race in a new EV with us in a new series um, and obviously representing my brand along the way, which is on the car and on the kit and everything, is, um, it's been massive. Yeah, it, it, I think it was hard for me to think, hey, big a difference could this make? Obviously, he's going to be a great driver and great asset for the team, but I wasn't quite 
sure I wasn't really prepared really for how big his reach was on that side I mean we saw the racing team explode in terms of uh, press BBC News national yeah. coverage um, you know I was speaking with some retailers last week they were like oh yeah Jensen's joined XI on the racing side and it's like yeah so people are seeing it um, and feeling it it's, so it's, it's just it's just, cool. it's just great for you being able to get in more garages and more shops I, I, just, I when you when you signed him I was like that's that's a power move yeah just just because he's got such a clean brand in, in racing as well like he's, he, yeah. you know what I'm saying yeah and lovely guy and, driver. And, and we got on so well I mean that's why we're driving together really we um, we obviously race in Extreme E together um, he's got a team in that and we just hit it off and I said look we're doing some something really cool with Nitro in some really cool cars it's a one make series new series so there's no you know the problem with getting into a series that's already established is you're fighting all that wealth of experience yeah um, which for him is a is a professional driver. He wants to come into something where he's on a fair playing field with everyone else. And I think that's what the Nitro Rallycross offered. It, it was a new platform, a new car, where we could all start afresh. So nobody's got an advantage. Um, you know, the best man will win this year because they're all the same cars. Um, and I think that's why we got on. And I said, look, why don't you come come race with me? Come join Excite Racing, um, and let's go take on the world as a British team. So. How would you suggest that, because there's, there's a lot of people that listen to this that have brands in different niches, different businesses, If when when you're a brand and you're trying to sign someone of note, like a Jensen Button, what is the kind of process that you take through to do your due diligence and create that deal to make sure that it's not only uh, fair for the brand, but also it also pay, pays him off to be a part of it as well? Like, How do you go about negotiating all that? It's, it's going to be very personal, I think, depending on who you're talking to, your relationship with them, and, and what you're trying to do as a brand. I mean, we work with all sorts of different influencers across fitness, um, motorsport, different extreme types of sports. And I think with each each different influencer um, and partner, we have a different relationship. Some are very much just exchange-based. Um, you know, we want so many posts. They want so much money for the post, and we agree a fee, and off you go. Others, like... Um, uh, you know, me and Jensen is much more relationship based. You know, we're we're just friends. We want to go racing, and, and the brand comes with us. Um, so we support each other in that sense. So it's much more of an organic type of relationship, which is nice. And I think there's room for for all of those types in business. Um, so in terms of in terms in terms of just to give a bit of context, obviously you've been investing heavily over the years in growing your personal brand, as have I. And one thing I've personally noticed from from growing personal brand is that when you when you start to grow your personal brand and you start to put money into your podcast, start to put money into your, into your name, like you've put money into your name and racing and all that stuff, it, you just seem to attract a lot more opportunities into your life and a lot more of yeah. these relationships that you talk about. So it's like people ask me all the time, they say, you know, how do you book this guest? How do you book this guest? Like, how, how did I get here with you today it's because like we've built that relationship on instagram or you've been introduced yeah. to me from someone else and it's like that is that is the power of growing a, yeah growing your name yeah. and i think it's what they teach you or try and teach you a lot when you're younger is networking and i think it, ge- it gives it a bad sense to like you feel like you should go to these coffee meetings with oh people. stupid you know man. you just yes that's not networking but like people say to me well hey have you got this far and how do you do as much as you do and meet the people you meet and in uh, and I'm like, well, I just message people. I'm like, hey, do you, what are you up to? Where are you? What do you do? Do you want to get a coffee? Do you want to hang out? Just very it's, build relationships. And then they've got a friend yeah. who they introduce you to who knows this guy. And before you know it, your network's, um, you know, loads of people with a similar mission, I guess. Well, I, th- I think that um, the, 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 key, the, key, the key thing that I've found is actually taking a genuine interest in people. Mm. Because I because I've been genuinely interested in what you do for 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 six eight nine months since we followed each other on Instagram yeah. for argument's sake uh, mutual friends, and it's just like I took an interest in you as, yeah. a, as a human. Like, I didn't know we were going to do a podcast, and then we co- we're doing a podcast. Yeah, you know yeah. what I'm saying? Like that, that, that's and sometimes it's, it's building those relationships and just not looking for anything. I think hey, we've all been there where you're like, right, I need to find this guy who knows this guy, and and you go a bit hard in. I mean, we've all been there. Um, and it doesn't all sometimes it works and they, you get a reply other times you get nothing but I think the more organic the relationships are the more you get from it in a whole sense I think I think I think I think just add value to other people in in your industry and then it all just comes back around anyway like you can just help people out but a lot of people like you say are going are going in there flying in there wanting to get something out of the relationship day one it's not even about that is it because it just come it just comes comes naturally from yeah. it yeah with with obviously everything you do, I want, I want to touch upon this as well because obviously you've you you and the family have built a phenomenal um, commercial real estate portfolio in the UK. We're, we're sat in one of your business parks right now where we're filming this podcast. 
and it's and it's phenomenal. Like, do you know what I mean? What you what you've done here? Credit to you all. How do you, how did you go about starting in this commercial space in terms of like family and build and building what you've built? Yeah, that that was my father actually, which um, he's done a, an amazing job of being a serial entrepreneur, is what I call him. Um, you know, never stops really, and I think he came from the car industry, as I said went into plastics recycling business which was I guess was his main prominent business that he was involved in his 20s and 30s um in in when he sold that he got into real estate um commercial property which is this this was actually an old rank xerox site it employed 5000 people um rank xerox was closing their operations down globally um and uh yeah purchased the site with a plan that you know the 5000 jobs needed to stay here and there needed to be work in the forest um on on uh, on that sort of level. So this site now, it's got thousands of small businesses, some large ones, um, employing four to 5,000 people on the site um, in its warehousing, its offices. I think we're in one of the big office towers here now, which is, um, you know, uh, you know, can come and rate a, rent a small office space for a room uh, for a day, for a month, for a year, whatever your business needs. So built from there, um, and, and I sort of got involved to a latter stage of that, more on the M- new development property side. So I have my own property portfolio business, which ranges from houses um, in various stages of planning, new build. Um, and also we have some uh, sort of brain development resi sites, which is, you know, old places being done up and different things like that, yeah, holiday yeah, yeah. homes, different things. So, yeah, it's quite a vast property portfolio at the minute. But it's something I was never super passionate about, I would say, mainly just... Being involved in racing, in the energy drink business, everything's fast moving. One minute it's a high, next minute it's a low. Much more up and down. Um, the property side for me, although I'm involved with my own property assets, it's it's more slow. There's six months of planning. You're waiting for answers. Development takes a long time. Um, it's a slower churn, I guess. With with advice to in regards to like a lot a lot of people have been brought up in this world, especially in the UK and and Australia too, where it's like go to school, get a safe, secure job, buy a house. Get, tie yourself down with this mortgage and I don't essentially think that is the right way for a lot of people to go we, we, in terms of in terms of if you if you're a young person listening to this who wants to who you know or just any person listening to this who wants to actually start to build some some assets from 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 ground zero what would your advice be in terms of like do you do you, would you go commercial day one knowing what you know now would you go would you go res and how would you, and how would you kind of work on building a portfolio yeah I think um Tricky one to answer, I think. It depends on personal circumstances to a large amount. Um, But I would say if you're already in the property industry or you've got a foot in the door, maybe you've bought a house, sold a house, you've remortgaged the one you're in. um, I think something I've learned in business really is there's nothing like what than what you know. Um, And I think a lot of it is, you know, do things that you, especially depending on your risk, potential for risk appetite i mean this is a very risky business isn't it you've got to yeah, 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 yeah. that's a different thousand, yeah. type of risk um i think if you know you're remortgaging your house to do something you just got to be careful with where you put your your money in, in into what assets so yeah i think it's it's probably too personal of a thing to to comment on um for your listeners but i think there's different ways of doing it because i think i think with co- with commercial though one thing i've noticed about on a personal level with me i bought i bought my first place at 18 you know, I paid it off when I was 30, which is a bad idea because now you've got to remortgage it and pull money out and all this stuff. But I, if I'd put that same amount of money into in, into the commercial asset, I'd be getting double the amount of rent while I'm getting off the off the residential yeah, yeah, asset. Yeah. So it's yeah. like, it's one thing I've had to learn the hard way is the yeah. fact of like commercial is, a, is probably a better bet for most people, even though you have to put a bit more deposit down than residential. Yeah, and I think the property industry, I mean, it's been one of those things... I read something last night. Some a woman, she's 104. Yeah, this yeah. is in the news last night. She bought a property after the Second World War for 800 quid, and she's still in that property now, four bed house. It's worth 560 grand. Um, and you you just see that inflation of house prices in, in in asset values and then income. Back then, I think you know 50, 60, 80 years ago, probably three years income would buy you a house. Yeah. Now three years income would not buy you a house at all yeah, 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 might yeah. buy your car park space especially in London so I think that's the different dynamics now and I think the mortgage industry is changing um, you know the rental industry is becoming more apparent I think 70% now are rentals in the UK um, or it's, it's growing in that, no, that mortgages but yeah I think 
the industry is ripe for change. Um, it's getting pushed into rental models is what I can see, especially where I live in London. Um, you know, renting in London is expensive, but mortgage in London is even more crazy. So, yeah, I think um, things things are going to change potentially. I mean, we're seeing now, you know, stocks are starting to drop. There's different things going on in the economy now. Base interest rates have gone up. So I things mean, are changing. With with a with a property portfolio, the pro- the size of money that you've got in property, do you do you put do you have a, a portion of it that's that you would happily put up for sale when you think prices are prices are a good price to rebuy buy in at a later time? Do you have a portion of your portfolio that you put aside for that, or do you just hold all of it forever? Um, historically held, um, I think you know uh, you know Warren Buffett makes a good example of this of, of you know, he was talking about crypto really and, and the ideas of that, but he related it to property of you do get swings and troughs in property, but there's always a stable asset underneath it that predominantly supply and demand will go up over time. Um, so I think unless you need to cash out of something, you could probably hold um, and make capital gain and, and do different things with it. Like you said, remortgage it and get liquidity out that way, which is, is what a lot of people do. Um so I, I would say predominantly we've held property. I mean, there's places now that we think you potentially would sell to to net some of the gain um, and reinvest into something else. But again, we've been uh, you know quite fortunate. Some of the other businesses we've done in renewables and things they've generated cash income as well. So haven't necessarily needed to to release capital from property to yeah. create equity in essence. So yeah, there's different ways to do it. Yeah, no, and and I even in this market that we're in now, where we're at sky high prices in terms of historically. Obviously, in ten years' time, historically, it's like this. Though. Yeah, yeah, yeah. All the, all the time, that's the problem. So, that, that's the problem. But I mean, you've but seen it in the pandemic. People sold houses because they were high, but then the next house you buy is high, higher. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. And end up it's a bit stuck then. So. Yeah, it's it's just like, but but what? But I is it as a as a as a property buying group? Are you? Or every every financial year you're buying more and more property is essentially what you're doing. Generally, you never, yeah. you never stop buying property. No, no. In a, in essence, I think. Uh, with interest rates and in uh, inflation and things, cash in the bank is never all that sensible. Um, so a lot of the time, it is reinvested either in startups or uh, or generally property assets. When you when you when you're talking about investing in startups, what kind of what kind of businesses are you looking for to invest in in the startup world? Um, for us, scalable, high growth businesses. So something that can scale, that can have high growth. Um, probably not quite as risky as this. Because of course, to make the you know ninety nine point nine nine percent of these businesses will fail. Hopefully, we don't touch some wood. Yeah. Um, but yeah, so probably high growth. You know, one is very quite apparent for us at the minute, which is again why we're involved in the EV racing is uh, the sort of what I would say is the next dot com, which is the whole energy revolution. Everything is going green, sustainable, renewable. That is the future of of the green economy, I guess. And I think there's a lot of money to be made there. Gonna be a lot of great startups in that space. Um, where where do you see the money coming from in that space? So is it is it charging points? Is it what what, what is yeah, it? Yeah, everything like that. I think you've got charging points. You've got supplying electricity, storing it, sending it, moving it. Um, everything in the, in the electricity space from electricity is where I think there's going to be huge growth potentials. Um, I mean, we're we're constantly looking for businesses in, in that space to invest in. So that's something the racing does a great job for me. Um, I'm racing in the EV world. Um, with some of the biggest companies in the world that do EV types of things. As you know, My Energy is my uh, sponsor, which are a charging company. Um, and there's other businesses in that space growing at, at you know, tremendous rates. So it's a really cool industry to look into. Do you, do you think, though, that the grids in, in like Australia, the UK, America, are going to be able to cope with with, all, with everything going electric? Because because yeah. I, I've I've even seen I've even seen therein that. lies the opportunity I think yeah, that, yeah that's yeah. what I'm saying like I think there's more I think I think the infrastructure side is even is even yeah. more cashed up ready to go like in terms of like we're talking about yeah I see all these Tesla charging points popping up everywhere yeah. but they but and they look all nice and great at the service station but they're on the old grid so like this old grid in the UK and the old grid in Australia needs upgrading yeah. I mean the whole east coast of Australia's grid. Is like if 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 one power station goes out, it knocks out knocks okay. out half the it knocks out half the country. Like yeah. it's same over here. If if two or three power stations go down in one go, or two or three terminals, you can knock out half the country. Yeah, no, and I think um, there's there's going to be money made in that area, so resourcing the grid, creating backups, battery storage. Um, yeah, there's going to be a lot of potential in this area. And what where where else are you looking at, at, at in in that sphere? Well, we, yeah, I think for us, we're looking in that 
storage of energy space i think for us is yeah. where we're looking to go so the batteries type stuff yeah battery type stuff some this mainly the reason we're involved with ev racing apart from i like to race and it's at the highest end in, in racing is great um it'd be nice to make some money from racing and part of that is looking in this ev space whether it's storage of electricity for charging and different things like this that's where i see that industry going um and if you can find a way in it's going to be a really exciting space yeah, it's epic. Uh, mate, mate, I can't I can't believe how much see, most people think you're just a race driver. Yeah. That's that, that that's on that's on the things. I know I want that this is the reason I wanted to do this podcast with you today, because I knew how much more there was to it than just Oliver Bennett, the race car driver, the guy that sits in the car and drives drives at clap out speed. Yeah, yeah. That's so, what you see on Yeah, <laughs> that's that's what you see that's what you see on Instagram. But yeah, you don't, yeah. But like there's all this behind it. There's the commercial real estate, there's the branding, there's all this stuff. And I I hope you guys at home have got a lot out of that. If you were gonna give some like if, if if from from everything you've experienced in life through building brand through being a CEO of a company through g- getting things off the ground through being a race driver if you if you if you consolidate you know one piece of a golden advice that you could pass to the next generation if you couldn't take any of it with yeah. you what what kind of advice would you give to someone coming up who wants more for themselves and get more out of life I think I would just say the biggest two things I think has put me in good stead with anything I've done is 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 be positive and put yourself out there. And I mean, what do I mean by that? I think from a practical thing, I mean, there was me coming in, um, you know, in racing with some of the best racing drivers in the world. And I didn't necessarily have the, the history that they had um, to learn from. But I just sort of thought, you know, like, I'm here. The car's there. I'm getting in it. Just almost like, fuck it. You just, you just get in, get put yourself in those places that feel uncomfortable um, and every day I live by that, just trying to feel uncomfortable in a positive way. Um, you know, don't do anything that's going to hurt yourself, but just put yourself into a situation where, you know, the first time I sat down with the first supermarket and tried to pitch the drink, I was nervous. Was my debt good? Was the drink good? I can remember actually one of my first meetings with, with one of the big multiples in the UK. Looking back now, I did not have a clue what I was on about. So no reason they didn't stock us fair play to them because I was there very green, just like, why? Well, like, it looks nice on the shelf. Like, in you know, yeah, that was uncomfortable, but look where I am now. And, and you, yeah. learn along, you learn on that journey. So, yeah, you just got to put yourself out there, stay positive and, and just keep rolling with it. Yeah, I love that. I love that. And you're, you're right. It's, it's, it's in, in essence, it's just don't stop. Mm. same with this podcast yeah. same with your racing team same with this energy drink it's like if you don't stop you can't really fail you can only get better can't you exactly so it's just like yeah many, many there's people, no turning back many, <laughs> many many people check out too early like yeah i, th- I think it's like the the statement three feet from gold is so is so critical in that you know yeah. people people like if you there's that image yeah. in there of that guy pickaxing at the wall yeah and he turns around just as the last one would have got him through through to the, to the to where he was trying to get yeah. to um, and I think that is a, it's an important thing to learn in life. And yeah, even like you, you, you paused a period now before you've started your podcast again in the UK, but you've started again. And I think there's been times Mate, where uh, it's literally not, and it's, it's not even been, not even been a pause for me. They've been rolling out weekly. There's been, there's been zero pause. It's just a case, oh, okay. it's, just, it's just a case of, for me, it's like you're, I'm in a new location now. It's like, you've got to book guests, you've got to build connections, this, Re- that and the other. And it's, you know what I mean? It's like, and we had it in the pandemic. Re re gearing everything and like it's almost like setting the train off again. It's a lot it's, of effort. It's like I got. It's like before this podcast is like oh you know and I got I didn't have the lights. So I got to go get the lights. So I had to go get all this all yeah. this stuff. It's like people people let get flustered around stuff that they shouldn't get flustered around. It's like okay, I've got to get lights, so I'll just go get lights. Just go get it. Do you know what I mean? Yeah. Like <laughs> fuck so the expense. What? I need them. Yeah. You, you, no, there's no. There is zero point dwelling on what you need to get yeah. you where you've got to go to. Exactly. Yeah. So you may as well just you may as well just embrace yeah. it, mate. Thank you so much for no, your time. Thank you. On the Thanks pod. for having me. Enjoyed it. No, I appreciate your time. And guys, I don't know when this is coming to Australia or it's in the UK now. So if you're watching this in the UK, Excite is in the UK. Pick a can up at. 900 garages, so you're never more than 10 minutes away from a garage with these. With so these, just pull in and in. see if it's there. And the, when when are you planning on dropping these in Australia? Soon. I mean, US this year, Australia next year would be good. If you've got any contacts after this, yeah, well, uh, yeah, I've got, I've got, I've got, <laughs> I, I'm sure. I'm sure I can get this stocked for you. Yeah, some, good some well, point. nice and warm. So uh, yeah, guys, do me a solid favor: like, subscribe to the YouTube channel. I'd appreciate that. It's always better to watch this podcast than it is to listen to it just on Apple or Spotify. But uh, again, I appreciate you. Share, comment, drop us both a message. Let us know what you got out of it. I tried to drill in deep on branding and getting getting out all the essence of of why these cans are this color and and everything for 
you know, just, just so that you guys can really understand what goes into making a brand, not just look appealing to, to the person who's created it, but also get it picked up off the shelf so that you can sell lots of it too. So thank you again for your time. No, thank you, mate. Much love. Subscribe. Ciao. Cheers. Don't forget to subscribe to the Frankie Lee Podcast.